whom is this their first real conference comeback? Okay. That's cool. Excited? Yeah. Yeah. There's like three people excited. Everyone else is just hung up. Get on with it, Heidi. Okay, uh, how many of you are here to uh, learn? Be inspired. Okay. <laughs> Which is quite unfortunate for you because they've given me this talk as a keynote. So if you're here to learn or get inspired, um, wait until after my talk because you're not going to get any of that here. What are you going to get here? You're going to get, um, well, actually, what is this talk about? So this talk is a sequel to Silver Bullet Syndrome. Anybody saw that talk? Uh, okay, so one person. That's good. <laughs> if I had known that, I would have repeated so many of the other um, jokes. Uh, so what was that talk about? That was me ranting at the industry. And uh, the industry just doesn't stop giving me reasons to rant. Uh, but with as many sequels, there's always a risk. So unless you've ever watched Ted 2, which is way better than Ted 1. And um, so, you know, I'm going to try and make this much, much better. And I'm going to call it the director's cut. Because I, I want to try and, you know, because there's a risk with sequels. So I'm just going to call this a director's cut. And the director's cut is kind of like a, a way for you to really do what you wanted to do in the original movie. Right? And the producers wouldn't allow you. And uh, in the previous feedback that I used to get from the other talk, they used to tell me that it was good, but it was really demotivating. And it was like really putting you down at the end of the talk and like really, you know, kind of asking yourself why. Um, I, I didn't change that part. That stays, the, that stays the same. So let's take a step back and ask ourselves why we're we here. And I, I very much like the idea of... The second, like, as, as, a, as humanity, we are, yeah, yeah, we're just, yeah, okay. What are our objectives here in tech? Okay, it's, it's to solve interesting problems, yes? Show of hands, yeah, right? To make boatloads of money, show of hands? All right, I bet none of you are from Spain. Yeah. To automate everything? Uh, yes, yes, right? I used to love automating everything. That's, that's how I got, like, when I found out that I could automate stuff and then make things easier and, and actually help people. That was good. And then we took the automation too far. Um, and it's also to solve needs. That's, that's kind of it, right? We're here to kind of solve people's needs, our own needs, etc. And let's talk about needs. The year was 1990 and there was a web developer and he had a need to create a system for managing documentation. So he put this system together, and it was an HTTP protocol. It was a HTML, a browser, a web server, and a website. Back then, of course, none of this existed. You know, it, it was kind of created back then, and it was a simple thing. It was just like you know, navigating from page to page easily, and it solved a need. 30 years later, we have... Our system consists of a distributed set of microservices that talk to each other using GraphQL. Messages are stored in ActiveMQ and you use Kafka as a fail-safe option. We use serverless technology to calculate data which is stored in Redis and we're looking at adopting blockchain. And this is probably the CTO of some shop that has about 50 customers, right? And you kind of have to ask yourself why. I always say that like I want to have a Gordon Ramsay of the tech industry, you know, just go in there and say, what the, are you doing? And I, I tweeted that and someone said, you know, Gordon Ramsay wasn't really successful in trying to help those businesses. 90% of them shut down. I said, I don't care. I'm not in it to help. I'm just in it to, to shout. Anyway, I'm looking for producers. And if you want to collaborate, call me. <laughs> so back in the day, I started back in the day as well with web development. And I started in an in a ISP shop. Uh, where we were giving internet, connect, internet connection to people. If any of you remember this, this thing that was called a modem, it would go ta tang ta tang and you would dial up, right? And uh, so we were doing internet, we were providing internet, and we were still also doing websites. And I lived in Spain, still do, don't judge me. And, you know, there was, uh, there was a lot of real estate. So we used to do these web pages for real estate companies, and they used to send us emails with all of the, with all of the descriptions of the, of the, of the web page and the pictures, and it's like, okay, put this up, right? And my boss, he's like, he didn't like to work. He just liked to make money. So he's like, we've got to find a better way to do this, and along came Pink Floyd. Do you know what this is? What? 
Dark Side of the Moon, and apparently it's also the logo for CGI's. I don't know why. So CGI stood for Common Gateway Interface. Anybody use that? So Common Gateway Interface was basically this, this executable, normally on Linux, where you would kind of like call it and it would do something and then you could get that data back and, and do something with that data, right? But the problem was that it, was, uh, very, it wasn't great in terms of uh, efficiency because every request that you would make, it would launch a new executable, kind of like serv serverless technology nowadays. So it would launch a new executable. And then along came Microsoft and they said, oh, you know what, we're going to do something better. For, for one time they actually did. And it was called ISAPI. And ISAPI was similar to CGI, but instead of an executable, it was a dynamic loading library, a DLL. So then the first request would load this into memory, you would do everything, and then eventually when your server crashed, it would unload from memory. And the idea was very simple. You would make a request to the server, that server would talk maybe to a database, it would take data, it would combine it with HTML, and it would spit it back out. It's just how things used to work. Nowadays, you call it server-side rendering, right? And along came someone and said, hey, you know what? Let's add some scripting and JavaScript. And then, well, we are where we are, aren't we? And so they enabled JavaScript. Of course, nobody really understood JavaScript. Nobody really did JavaScript. They did this other thing called jQuery. So when they would say to you, do you know JavaScript? You're like, no, I know jQuery. And jQuery was actually good. It was a library that allowed you to do things in a very fast and productive way. And we started to do things, and it was nice. And jQuery had this thing, you know, it was combined at the same time with this thing called Ajax. Anybody heard of Ajax? Not this. Uh, it was <laughs> asynchronous JavaScript and XML, right? And some people didn't like XML, so they were doing Ajax, which is asynchronous JavaScript and, and JSON. And so they're like, oh, you know what? We can take this idea, and instead of refreshing the page all the time, we're going to create these things called single-page applications. And then that just blew up, right? Then we got AngularJS, and AngularJS was this fantastic thing around, uh, you know, um, being able to really, in a very productive way, put together a very, very complex application. But a lot of people didn't like it because from version one to version two, it was completely different framework, and everything you had done, you couldn't really upgrade. And so some people said, no, that's horrible, and it's not really nice, and we're going to do React. And React was there to try and simplify things for folks, right? React had a very simple architecture, which was called Flux architecture. Some people didn't really understand it, so someone created this other architecture called Reflux. I didn't find the logo for it. So, <laughs> and along came other things like MVC. MVC was a very, very simple concept. It started with Smalltalk, model view control. I had a model, which was my data. I had a view, which was my... Um, what people saw, and I had the controller that talked to this thing, but MVP, MVC wasn't good enough for some people because they were doing desktop applications, so they came up with this other model called MVP, and then the people that did MVP, they didn't really like it, and they said, no, we don't really like this MVP, we're going to do this other thing called MVVM, and then MVVM wasn't really nice because it's not about controller, it's about intention, so now you have MVI, and actually, what's the difference? Well, there's a 600-page blog post that tells you that tiny little subtle difference, but it is different. Right? And then, you know, now we're in the Vue.js and someone's saying, you know, this whole SPA stuff is giving me performance problems. Right? It, it's not really working well. Maybe we should get the server to render stuff. <laughs> and then you get articles about how using server-side rendering is going to boost performance and user experience. So we, we went from this simple idea to this whole complexity and now we're like, huh, why did we do that? I don't know. Like, you know, how we used to do it, yes? So now I've got a website for Ktor. Ktor is an, uh, who's heard of Ktor? Right, and this, and this segment's brought to you by Ktor. So I've got a website uh, for Ktor, which is a static site. It's got four or five pages, and I'm using Gatsby. Anyone heard of Gatsby? And I, I, you say, why are you using Gatsby? Well, because the web team at JetBrains use Gatsby. And I say to them, but I don't need this. It's like, fine, it's really scalable. When you need it, it'll work much better. And I don't understand it, but it's there. But it's 12 years of progress. This is old, like now it's even worse. And if you look at all the types of applications that we create, what do we do? We create stuff, we like create data, we read it, we update it, and we delete it. Like literally, we don't even have to delete anymore, right? Because GDPR, you don't delete anymore, right? So, we do CRUD. 
But you don't say to people, you do crud. It's embarrassing. What do you do? I crud. No. That's, that's, no, no, you don't do crud. But anyway, we do do crud in the majority of our applications. And we're like, well, we're doing this stuff, and we're doing this stuff over and over again. We're writing some code. You know what? This is painful because we don't like to copy-paste code. <laughs> that, now, that's a lie. Um, so we started to repeat this code, and we said, well, this is not really working well. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a few utility functions so that we don't have to repeat this code that is reading, updating, reading, updating, you know, creating, etc. But the utility function, it works well in a single application. Now you want to go across applications. So what do you do? You create a library. Now you've got this simple library that from one side, it's reading data. From another side, it's creating and updating data, separate functions. And you're like, no, someone said, no, there's a mismatch here. What mismatch? Well, you're using SQL Server. That's an object, you know, that's a relational model. And in school, they told us that the world is objects. And we have to model stuff as objects. So what did we do? We created a framework, and we called it an object relational mapper. And it didn't matter what database we used. Even if it wasn't relational, we still wanted our ORM. But like, you're using CouchDB. It's a document DB. Yes, but does it have an ORM? No, I'm going to write one for it. There's a reason it doesn't have an ORM. And you're like, oh, my ORM is giving me issues. And they told us we're designing it wrong. Right? And thus came the big divide. The big divide was also called command and query responsibility segregation. Anybody heard of this? Probably everyone. Back in the old days when this came about, when you used to Google CQRS, Google would say, did you mean cars? That's why this blog actually has the did you mean cars. That's where it comes from. And CQRS started to become famous by a, a, a friend of mine called Greg Young. And Greg Young, when he started to talk about this at a conference at QCon, he talked about event sourcing as well, because it just so happens that he was doing event sourcing as well, right? So what did we interpret as, a, as an industry? We're like, oh, if you're doing CQRS, you've got to do event sourcing. Right, so now we've got to do event sourcing, and of course, Greg created a company called Event Store, which is an event, uh, event uh, database. So that didn't help, and we're like, okay, so this simple idea of right separating our reads from our writes, which was what we were doing with library functions, now comes back in the form of CQRS. And of course, if you're doing CQRS, you're not doing it properly if you're not doing domain-driven design. So now we've got this domain-driven design thing, but, and you're like, but I'm only doing this kind of like CRUD application. No, 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 no. CRUD is, CRUD is simple. You need Ibuki's languages. You need to separate your boundaries. You need to read this 500-page book. You're like, screw that shit. I'm not reading all this book. What's the most important thing? Oh, it's called a repository pattern. Right, so I'm doing domain-driven design because I've got repository pattern and these objects that are called aggregate roots. That's it. And it's fantastic. And how do I get all of that to work with hexagonal architectures? What? I don't know. But it's really, really cool. But I'm just reading and writing from the database. Yes, but this, is, this will allow you to evolve your application as time goes by. And then, of course, we had tools that I don't know how Visual Studio helps domain-driven design, but apparently it does, or at least try and sell. And of course, what was this all about? This was around the time when they told us that, that the um, architecture needs improving as well, right? The architecture needs improving. So we went from like, you know, one little thing, one little service that we used to do to a lot of services, right? You all know what I'm talking about. And as Simon Brown once said, if you don't know how to design a monolith, you sure as hell don't know how to design a good microservices or put in a less subtle way, this is what we ended up with, right? <laughs> And of course, microservices need to talk to each other. So how do you talk to each other? Well, you could just use HTTP. No, 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 REST. We had to use REST. What was REST? REST was a set of constraints written by a chap called Roy Fielding that nobody read. And they just said, oh, REST is pretty URLs over JSON. That's essentially what it is. And some folks said, well, this pretty URL over JSON is a little bit too hard. So what happened then? We took the concept of leveraging the HTTP protocol and all of the status codes and all of the wonders that it gives us and all of the caching, everything, and we said 200 OK, otherwise known as GraphQL. <laughs> so now, in my Ktor website, I've got a GraphQL object to give me back thumbnails. 
And of course, all of this requires building. And if we look back at the simplicity of how we used to build stuff in the old days, we used to have this concept of a source code. We put it through this thing called a compiler. That compiler sent us to a linker, and it gave us the application. But what was the problem? It was command line. It was a lot of arguments. We don't like remembering this stuff, no? That's why we're all fanatics of Git. So, you know, we, we like, no, this is no good, so we're going to try and make this better. And of course, we used to use script files, etc. But then along came for C and C++, this thing called make. Um, the Java world got Maven. M uh, the .NET world got MS build. And it seemed to be OK. And then someone said, no, it's not OK, it's XML. We don't like XML. And at the same time, there was another language called Ruby, which was beautiful. I, I've never used it, but it was beautiful. I don't know if it was beautiful, but they say it's beautiful, so it was beautiful. So there was this language called Ruby, which was beautiful. And they're like, hey, why don't I take this idea of Ruby using that for my build system? And they came up with Rake, right? Because it's a play on make. Do you get it? Yes, of course you do. And um, C sharp got cake. F sharp got fake. JavaScript got Jake. JavaScript also got Grunt and Gulp, and of course you have Webpack now, which nobody even knows what that is, but it's there. At the same time, we got Groovy. Well, well, I wasn't back then doing Groovy, but you folks got, may have got, got, gotten Groovy, and along came Gradle. And Gradle was fantastic, right? Because Gradle's like, take all of this ugly XML and reduce it to this. And it's beautiful, okay, and maybe a couple more files, but still, it's still small files, right? <laughs> And um, you know the idea is like you don't have to tell the build system how to do things. You just tell it what to do. And uh, how do I know what to do? Well, you read the 600-page documentation, um, or you just go to Google, right? And if anyone's ever used Gradle, what's the top thing that's searched for in Gradle? How to get rid of the refresh dependencies in IntelliJ IDEA, right? So what did we do at JetBrains? We're like, okay, well we support Maven. Um, Kotlin is this language. By the way, if anybody thinks that this talk is remotely about Kotlin, I, I hope you've realized by now it's not. Um, this, uh, you know, we, we're going to also use this thing called Gradle because, you know, these folks that do mobile development, how many do mobile development here? Oh, wow. Wait. Oh, hold on. I've got to take a picture of this. How many do mobile development here? Wow. So next time someone says to me, Kotlin's only for mobile, I'm like, no, look. So. <laughs> What did we do? We adopted Kotlin. Uh, sorry, we adopted Gradle. And uh, we, we adopted Gradle in this other technology that you may have heard of, which is called Kotlin Multiplatform, right? So Kotlin Multiplatform is beautiful. How many use it? There should be more. I, I'm not going to take a picture of that one. Uh, so the idea is very, very simple. You share code. You save time. So we allow you to share code, save time, be more productive. Now, of course, that productivity, you cannot then spend all that time that you save. You can't get to spend with your family or your hobbies or do more productive things. No, you spend it configuring Gradle. That's essentially what you're doing. <laughs> and talking about configurations, remember how XML sucked. XML sucked, so we said, let's use JSON. And you look at JSON and like, that's, that's OK. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's... Uh, it's not like I spend my life reading XML either, but yeah, this is kind of easier to read to the eyes. But somebody apparently said that JSON is unhuman readable. Yes, so they came up with YAML, which was let's use white spaces, because why the hell not? And here's a specification of YAML, which is really simple and allows you to have a human readable language. And you know, and what did people say about this? They're like, no, YAML sucks, so let's come up with TOML, which apparently now Gradle is using in certain lines of this. Like, yes, so Gradle and Tom are using TOML. For what? Because, well, I, 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 it's human readable. Yes, how many books do people read in JSON? <laughs> like, do you, do you spend your life reading JSON? No. When you look for something in JSON, you use a tool to search for it. Why the hell do you want to have something human readable? But anyway, so after you build all of this, you need to deploy. And back in the old days, you had a machine, you would deploy it. You'd create an installer, whatever you do. You would copy some files. You would do an X copy. You would do an FTP. 
There was an issue, of course, because it's like, oh, I forgot a file, I forgot some configuration issue, something's going wrong, and you're like, this used to work on my machine, and we solved that problem, and it was called Docker, right? We didn't call it my machine, we just said, Let's, here's a container, that's beautiful. Very simple idea, it's a simple file, you're like, here, this is what you need to do, it's scripted, set this up, and it goes well, now, of course, nowadays, you don't just deploy one thing. When you deploy, you really got to deploy because of microservices. So Docker came up with Docker Compose, right? Which is, okay, this is cool. But Docker Compose isn't enough for you. No. Or, or script file running three Docker commands isn't enough. No, you need the full-blown Kubernetes, right? What is Kubernetes? It's an amazing system that allows you to scale and deploy and monitor and everything like that. And if something goes wrong, you've got a workflow to figure it out. And that is not a joke. Okay? But it's hiding all the complexity from you. And now you need, yeah, no, it's not hiding any complexity from you. And now you need to deploy these somewhere. So again, you used to have a server and you used to do this FTP. And along came Heroku. Heroku was actually a really, really cool system. Heroku was like, let's take the idea of Git that I'm publishing to Git, right, to my main branch. And why don't I create another branch that when I push to that, it publishes. And that was around the Ruby time. And Heroku was actually built on Ruby, on Ruby on Rails. And it was fantastic. It really was. I'm not being sarcastic. It was a great idea. And, you know, this started to like pick up. And of course, what do, uh, you know, what does this open to us? This opens to us well, not to us, to cloud providers to say, hey, we've got a whole bunch of stuff that we can give you as well, right? So if you go to Google Cloud, now you've got a whole bunch of services that they use and apparently you need to use too. Why? And you don't know what it is, but it doesn't matter. There's everything that you could ever possibly think or need there, it's there for you to use. And of course, it's not just Google Cloud, right? If you go to Microsoft, Microsoft has the same thing, right? And they make sure that to tell you that everything is free up to 12 months. 13th month? Yeah, no, no, it's no longer free. Uh, I was going to do a video of AWS, but it took one and a half hours, so you can just scroll through all of those things, right? And of course, they give you certification courses on, on the cloud, right? But th there's actually, and this is not a joke, there is a certification course that you need to learn to figure out what you need to certify yourself on on the cloud first, right? So you need to take a course to understand everything there is and then figure out which one you want to learn and then get a certification for that. And by the time you get that certification, they call it a legacy service. And if you want to start a new project, don't use that legacy service. It's, all, it's already been six months. They call this cloud native, otherwise known as vendor lock-in. But it's beautiful. How many of you move from cloud to cloud? Okay, well, you probably abstracted the whole world. Right, and then of course you need to monitor and maintain all of these things and it was all about the DevOps. And DevOps again was a very, 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 very simple idea, right? And the creator said, you know what, let's get developers and operations to talk to each other, to understand what each other are doing, to get a feel for each other. What did we do as an industry? We created tools. And we're up there as well, you know, I'm like, I'm not just criticizing, I'm criticizing even ourselves. Um, but don't worry, because if you have issues understanding DevOps, there is the Scaled Agile Maturity Framework, otherwise known as SAD-MF, that you can use to um, help yourself out. Now, one thing I've left out in all of this is security. So let's talk a little bit about security. And I'm not talking about the, you know, because security is actually complex, right? This is actually rocket science. So, you know, you know when they say it's not rocket science? No, actually security is rocket science. But let's address something else. Not the easy stuff, not identity and authorization. Because that you kind of use a service and hope that everything goes okay. No, let's address this little aspect here, right? Now, I'm sure you all heard of this incident when someone pulled a service which was called LeftPad, and they pulled it and the world collapsed, right? Uh, this, was the sur this was the package, right? The community came together and we created leftpad.io as a service, so that won't ever happen again. Now, if you go through the NPM repository, for instance, and I'm, I'm just not picking just on NPM, this happens always, you find a whole bunch of things. Back in 2016, I looked at IsArray, which was a package that had 18 million downloads, 72 dependent packages, and it actually fits on a tweet. That was the package. Object array to string. That was the package. It had 100 files for test, deployment, MPS, configuration, all of it. That was it. Fits in a tweet. 
but it's beautiful. It's reusable. And of course, it's not, you don't have just is array. You have is negative, is positive, is zero negative, is positive, is array, is not array, is false, is something like array, has an identity crisis. So now when I look at my Ktor site, look what I've got for my four static pages. I've got all of these tiny little packages that I have no clue what they are, what they do, but the important thing is that they're there should I need them one day, right? Now, what does this lead us to? Well, coming back to security, this is from this year. Yes, tiny little package installs malware. This does that, yeah? And then, and I'm, this isn't just about packages, Docker containers. There's, there's 10,000 verified Docker containers. There's 9 million other images. How many of you look through everything your Docker containers do or your packages do? Not really. And the worst part about this is that we bring in all of these dependencies and we don't even care what version we're building with. Right? This whole re reproducible build nonsense, nah, we only used to do that in the old days. In the old days, we actually used to check in the version of the libraries inside our version control system. Nowadays, you don't do it because it takes too much space or it's like too slow. Yes, back in the days, we used to wait. Oh God, I sound like an old man yelling at everything, don't I? Back in the days, <laughs> we used to yell at everything. No, 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 that was me. Anyway, but we don't even care about versioning, but don't worry about it because, and I have experience with this, procurement is on the job. Right now, procurement, what they do is they send you these security and supply chain questionnaires. We recently got one of these where they asked us, uh, we want to make sure that your software doesn't use Log4J. I said, but you're a ReSharper customer. They're like, right, so does it use Log4J? I'm like, well, ReSharper is .NET. There is no Log4J for .NET. So you're saying it doesn't use. So can I tick this box that says it doesn't use Log4J? Yes, you can. I didn't tell them it used is uses log for n, which is a replica of log for j for dot net, but separate code base. So no, actually it doesn't use that. And then we talk about supply chain attacks. Like we are so screwed and we don't even know it. We just go to bed every night and say, oh, I just hope my packages are okay, right? But it's getting better because we've, ta we've decided that this complexity that we're drowning ourselves in isn't just enough for ourselves. We want to do it to the world as well. And we want to give the population more complexity to think about because 98% processing cookies and options on the web isn't enough. We're now providing everyone with Web3, or sorry, Web3, right? And this is under the promise of a fair and distributed web. You know that system where you had computers all over the world and they would talk to each other over a protocol that was, what, what is the word for that? Oh yeah, distributed. Now Web3 is going to bring us distribution. Right? And why? Because blockchain. And, and because we, know we don't need to succumb to the um, you know, corrupt governments and use crypto. Ask El Salvador how that's working out for them. And you know, the stock market's going bad, so if you really want to make sure that your money crashes, buy some NFTs. Because this guy bought a tweet and he lost all of it. The tweet's still there. He just lost the URL to it. If you want to find out more about how the fire of the web is going, I suggest that you follow this account. So in summary, what is my point with all of this? Nothing. But I told you that at the beginning, I don't have much of a point, right? This is basically my rant, except let's go back to the question of what are we doing? Or more importantly, why are we doing it? So we read blogs, we go to conferences like this one and many others. We listen to thought leaders and we think to ourselves, oh, you know what? I want that. And, like, and then at some point on the train ride home, you're convincing yourselves that you not only want that, you need that. And you forget about the context, <laughs> right? Well, you know, Netflix is using Chaos Monkey Engineering. I need to. Why? Well, I'm sure I'll need it one day. I mean, if they need it, I'll need it. Are you the scale of Netflix? No, but I could be. No, you could never be. <laughs> or just because Postgres, Uber, Uber switches from MySQL to Postgres doesn't mean you have to. In 2013, Uber wrote a blog post that said, migrating from MySQL to Postgres, March 13, 2013. In 2016, they wrote another blog post that says, switch from Postgres to MySQL. You could have saved yourself a lot of money in three years, but I was around and I heard people saying, hmm,
this this blog post has some valid points and this really does concern us as well. Maybe we should do the same thing. Go from microservices to monoliths and back again. Or the other way around, right? Because, hey, if you can't design a monolith properly, microservices aren't going to help you. And of course, all of these has other side effects, which is called analysis paralysis, which I'm sure we've all suffered, yes? You know, what, what should I use, ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ? Should I use DocumentDB or relational model? Should I use microservices or services? Should I use, you know, patterns? What patterns should I be using? What architecture do I need? And we start to focus so much on the what as opposed to the why. And then you start to ask yourself, well, what are we doing? Are we doing CV-driven development? Yes, because that's how we sell our CVs. That's how we hire people. When we look at people, we're like, oh, oh, they know Kotlin. They, or they, they know Java. Hmm, they don't know Kotlin. Well, yeah, they're, they're monkeys. They only learn Java. They, they can't pick up new things. But that's how we advertise stuff, and that's how we hire stuff. Right? Do you, I want someone that knows React.js. Well, I know Angular. No, I need someone that knows React.js. Well, what do we do? Do we do knowledge-driven development? And do we ask ourselves, do I really need that? Or more importantly, does my customer really need that? You say, but no, I'm building with flexibility in mind. I'm building so that tomorrow I can change stuff. I'm building a clean architecture. Sure, yes. But first of all, all of that comes at a cost. Back in the day of ORMs, I used to create an abstraction over my ORM. Why? In case I would ever have to switch out an ORM. You know how many times in my career I switched out an ORM? Never. Exactly. So I lost all the benefits of the ORMs, and I did that, right? Now, there's services that provide you abstractions over clouds, right? So if you want to go from one cloud to another, you can. Ask yourself, is it worth it? Is the trade-off worth it? Because all of this complexity also comes at a cost. Every time we create these flexible, overwhelmingly beautiful, scalable architectures, they come at a cost. And the question is, when someone joins, how much is it going to cost them to actually understand that? And is it of any value? There is no shame in saying my application is a crud. Not every application needs to be domain-driven design with event sourcing and scalable to the point of no return. How many times do you actually need it? And yes, sure, there are complex systems in the wor world. I'm not saying they're not. But why does it seem that we have this urge to solve complexity by more complexity? It's like we take pride in complexity. We're like, yeah, this system is so complex, you would never understand it. Right? Why? Why? Because it's easier. Now, if I say, let's move back to um, simplicity, it's not an easy task. Because it's so much easier to say, well, this is a complex situation. You really need to fully understand it. Because it's easier to say that than it is to say, okay, how can I actually simplify this? How can I make it so that people don't necessarily need to understand the underlyings of absolutely everything to make things work? Right? We can try and abstract things, but to try and simplify them. Because we spend so much time talking about user experience. Make the user experience better. Make it better for the user. Make this. And what about us? How much time do we spend trying to make it easier for ourselves? We don't. We just inherently say, no, software development is complex. And let's just, uh, you know, add more flexibility. I mean, imagine in the, in the field of, uh, of engineering. Someone's building a bridge. Oh, I'm just going to build three in case. You know, or I'll make this one extensible so it's easy for change. And yet here we are doing all of these things instead of just striving for the simplest possible solution and essentially striving for simplicity. And I'll end with a very famous quote that says, you don't want simplicity because you can't handle simplicity. You need the complexity. You want the complexity. We use acronyms like YAGNI, KISS, DRY. We use these as the backbone of a life spent designing with simplicity in mind and you use them as a punchline by Colonel Nathan Jessup. Thank you.